you know, I have bad jokes, but I was like, Hansel just took it to another level. So I was like, at least I know there's someone worse than me. <laughs> totally fine. Um, anyways, anyways, we are continuing our series on the cross. Um, and we are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this week. Um, so if you can turn with me there. I'll be reading from verses 18 to 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, once again, we come humbly before you, and as we have read your word, talking about um, specifically what wisdom and folly looks like truly, as your word describes it, um, we pray for more illumination, God, and we pray that you would reveal and have our eyes and our hearts just open to all the things that you want to say and speak to us. Um, so once again, Lord, I come humbly and broken before you, God, um, and it is by your grace that I'm standing here right now to share your word. And so thank you once again for that honor and that privilege. Um, I pray that though it is your words that are being, being spoken, um, that you would speak directly um, to your people. And so we thank you for this time, and we give you all the glory and all the praise once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to start off by asking a, a simple question, and it's this. Has God ever worked in a way that you didn't expect? Has God ever worked in a way that you did not expect? Uh, because it seems to me that throughout history, God has worked against people's expectations quite often. You know, this past week I was in my um, devotionals and I was reading a story about how God appears to Abram at 99 years of age, 99 years old, almost 100, to tell him that he was going to have a child and still that promise of being a father to many nations, right? At that old of an age when they're kind of past their prime, you know, things have slowed down for them a bit. And now God is saying, no, you're, you're going to have that child I was telling you about. And you're still going to be the father of many nations. Right? You're still going to have as numerous descendants as the scars in the sky. Like that, that promise is still there. But at that old of an age, you'd wonder, hmm, I wonder why God would work in that way. Or um, in Joshua, when God tells Joshua and the Israelite army to march around the city walls of Jericho for a week, right? Once a day for six days, and then on the seventh, seven times. And then obviously we know that the walls of Jericho came tumbling down after they played instruments and they shouted. But why marching around walls? What? Um, I also think about the story of Paul and Silas, you know, when they were in, in, in the book of Acts and they were arrested and beaten and thrown in prison. And then we learn about the Roman jailer and how the conversion there happens. But as I was kind of reflecting on just how God seems to work throughout history, 
a lot of it goes against our expectations. The way we would expect God to work, the way we would expect God to reveal himself and all of those things, but not quite the way human beings would imagine. And if God has worked this way throughout history, and as we read in this passage today, why wouldn't his plan of salvation be any different? Of course God's plan of salvation, the way, the methods, the, the means of salvation would of course not look like the way humans would imagine. And this is what we, the text is bringing before us, is that God's plan of salvation is an old wooden cross. An old wooden cross. That God would take this instrument of scorn, this instrument that was reserved for the most vile, the most violent of criminals, and he would choose to die on one. And from this passage, we learn, if anything, that there's nothing more unlikely that redemption would come through this humiliating crucifixion. There's nothing more unlikely than that. And we can see that based on people's response, that the cross is just utter foolishness to so many people. It's a stumbling block to Jews. It's foolishness to the Greeks. But because of its unlikeness, Paul wants to stick by his convictions, and that's where the text begins. He writes these, um, writes these in verses 18 through and on. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So Paul is actually paraphrasing a passage from Isaiah, but essentially he's saying this, that God's plan of redemption does not look like the way that humankind has imagined, but also, but also that God wants to, in fact, thwart and to put down any human wisdom as it pertains to salvation. And that this response of the cross, this, this, what it seems like foolishness, really, is that how God would work, how God would use those means to save human, a rebellious human. So today's goal is, is simple in one sense. The, the title I've, of this sermon, I put worldly wisdom versus gospel foolishness. But really, I want to invert those two first two words. And that the gospel, God's plan, is really wisdom. And in fact, that the world and its idea of wisdom is, is really folly, is really foolishness. And so today we're going to break this section down into three sections, or three responses, really. Three different responses that we see. First, the response of the Jews, the response of the Greeks, and then the response for us today. So let's start with the Jewish people. What is their deal, and why are they struggling to embrace this message of the cross? What is stumbling them? What is hindering them from wanting to say yes to the work that Jesus has done on the cross? We read that in verse 22. It says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. So Jews are looking for signs. You see, for the first century Jew, dying on a cross signified that someone was under God's curse, God's wrath. So their argument then is, how could someone who's under God's curse also be the savior of the world? How could someone who's cursed, if this instrument of curse, if this is what it symbolized, and the fact that someone died on it, how could that also be the means of salvation? They cannot understand that. In fact, there's a passage in Deuteronomy that talks about this curse of someone being hung on a tree. Um, and that, in fact, I'll read that for us here. It says, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. It's interesting. So a Jewish person, a Jewish rabbi, would have probably said, what? Look at what it says in the first five books of the Bible. Right? It says that if you hang a man on a tree, that man is cursed. So how then could Jesus be the Savior? That is their argument. This is something that they cannot quite grasp. Um, the Jews were also seeking signs, right? They were, they were promised this Messiah, this deliverer, um, and they were expecting someone to come um, as this powerful person who would overcome all the evil forces in this world, 
right? Someone who probably looks like a combination of all the Avengers put together, right? Someone that just has all of this might, and they would just push their way through and just conquer the world and rule it. That's what they were expecting. I don't blame the Jewish people either, because if you think about it, their history with God is filled with a lot of signs, right? God delivering his people out of Egypt, parting the Red Sea, right? Leading his people through a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. They had seen all these wonderful makings of God working. So, of course, then they would expect the Messiah to look like this political strong deliverer. And then Paul is writing about Jesus, this lowly, humble man right, who died on a cross. And for the Jews, they cannot understand or accept why that is the means of salvation. See, for the Jews, the cross did not appear powerful. And they wanted signs and miracles, not a symbol of weakness and shame. The interesting thing about this word, a stumbling block, um, in the Greek, it's actually uh, a word called scandalon, which is where we get the word scandalous. Scandalous. So to them, this message of the cross is not only um, a stumbling block, it's scandalous. It's like, how could, um, it's, it's offensive. It's, it's completely absurd. Right? They cannot embrace that. It's just completely, uh, it's scandalous to them. If we take the Jewish response, but then Paul also writes about the, the Greeks as well, or the larger people, um, Gentiles as well, and says that they seek wisdom. See, to the non-Jewish world, the cross is foolishness. The cross is foolishness. It's dumb. It doesn't make any sense. Right? Criminals died on crosses. And so they cannot see how a cross, right, this wooden instrument, would provide any moral or philosophical standard to help them towards salvation. It's offensive. And a lot of times we get the argument today that it's primitive. Right? How can you say that this cross from over 2,000 years ago that someone died on is the means of salvation? That's the argument there. It's complete folly to them. The Greeks, they pursued wisdom, right? This the idea of knowledge and, and all of these. They had great success at that. You think of all the great Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato. Right? They were known for their thinking. They were known for their wisdom. And so if they were to rationally and logically think about the cross, they could not attribute a savior to it. It did not make sense to them. And so to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, it's utterly foolish. The idea that God, through his, his son, took on flesh, right, live the life that we should have lived, died the death that we should have died, all of that to bear our sin, right, to take all of the divine wrath and judgment on, upon himself so that we wouldn't have to go through that, all of that, that whole message to them is just complete and utter nonsense and foolishness to the Greeks. The interesting thing about this is I was thinking about the response back in the day is that it hasn't really changed much today either. Um, in conversations that I've had with people, in, in objections and questions that you have about the message of the cross, you get the same kind of response. Right? People who are looking for signs and wonders, I don't think that's changed very much either. Right? How many times do you hear someone saying, I need proof, give me evidence, right? I, if, if I see God tangibly working in my life, then I'll know for sure that he's real. That's not even a non-Christian kind of response. That's a Christian response, too. That some people would even test God in that way. Right? The immaturity that comes from that. Oh, yeah, if God just did this, if he did something in my life, then I know for sure that he exists, and I'll fully believe in him. You know what's crazy about that idea? How many signs that Jesus did, how many miracles and wonders he did, and how many people still didn't believe? It's fascinating. You would think that there would be a correlation has nothing to do with each other at times. Just because God delivers, shows his great sign, this great miracle, has his great breakthrough, it doesn't always lead to lasting faith. There's prime examples of that. The other response is what I just said, is people think that the cross is just foolish. It's dumb. They think it's primitive. The argument there is, well, 
I don't need saving from myself. Um, towards the end of his life, uh, and I shared this, I think, with our small group as well, C.S. Lewis um, was writing um, one of his last books. It was called God in the Dock, I believe. And he was making kind of an observation of what he thought the future generations will look like, what, what the world would look like. Um, and he came to this conclusion. It's just this idea that people, even in his day, were thinking that um, with, the, with the advance of technology, with the advance of, of modern medicine and all of these wonderful things, just advances and advances and advances, that the world was getting better, that basically people were saying, humans can improve as well because of that. And he was reflecting on that idea. Like, as the world gets better, humankind must get better as well. But towards the end of his life, he came to the conclusion, basically, that, look, no matter how much the world seems to advance, no matter how many new technological advances there are, how many me medical discoveries there are, he says, one thing will never change. The human heart. The human heart will never change. It will always be at enmity with God. It will always have its selfish tendencies, its sinful tendencies. So no matter how many iPhones get released, no matter how many iPads are released, even if there's a cure for cancer in this generation of lifetime, this doesn't change. That's the conclusion he came to. And it's fascinating, as I was thinking about the responses we get from over 2,000 years ago from the church in Corinth, that Paul is trying to defend and try to persuade the Corinthian church, the same thing, the same arguments still come up 2,000 years later, just maybe packaged a little bit differently. So as we kind of talked about how the Jews respond to the message of the cross, how the Greeks the Gentiles respond to the message of the cross. Paul then kind of transitions to the church at Corinth, which is really to the message and the people of God today. What is he trying to tell us? What is he trying to convey to us? And we see that from verses 26 and on. He says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, and not many were of noble birth. You see, the interesting thing about the people, the makeup of this church in Corinth at that time is they lacked the wisdom that the Greeks prized and loved so much. They lacked the power and the might that the Romans loved to see back in the day. And they also lacked any form of pedigree, right, and familial strong ancestry that the Romans, Jews, and especially, uh, I mean, the Romans, um, but especially the Jews prized. You know, where you came from, who your family line was, your last name. This church lacked all of that. They were a bunch of nobodies. And Paul is saying, why are you getting so caught up with all of this wanting more, right, than just the simple message of the cross? That was the main problem here at this church, is that the church at Corinth, they were getting sort of swayed by all these eloquent speakers, you know, all these great rhetoricians, and they were getting swayed by that and really just kind of abandoning, well, this message of the cross, not so important. Um, it doesn't sound really good to us. Um, we'd rather hear something more new and trendy. And Paul's saying, no, no. We need to come back to this same old message of the cross because that is the wisdom of God, and that is the power to save. This is what Paul is arguing for, that God would choose from this world those who seem foolish, those who seem weak and helpless, that he might use them to put to shame those who are strong and wise and so forth. Um, when I was in elementary school, um, I remember this. I don't remember exactly what grade. I want to say it was third or fourth grade. Um, during recess time, we were playing uh, kickball. Um, I loved kickball, especially with the rubber ball. Uh, I played soccer for many years, and I just couldn't wait to kick that ball out of the park because I, 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 I was able to kick really far, and so I had so much pride in that. Roll the ball to me, you know, kind of thing, and I was ready to blast it. Um, and I remember during recess time, we were picking teams, um, and uh, 
knowing that this is one of my favorite activities, that I was good at it, um, I was like waiting to, you know, be picked first on this team. So, you know, everyone's, you know, it's like this awkward third or fourth grade just standing around, you know, in a line and waiting to get picked by somebody, right? So there were two team captains, um, and one of the people, they were picking, you know, pretty much like the best players on the team, you know? Um, but I noticed that the other person, they were picking like the worst people, right? The ones that were not talented, the ones that couldn't kick very far, the ones who like sometimes even miss the ball when they're trying to kick, like that person was picking those kinds of people, right? Like the, the worst, like the, the team of misfits basically is what that team looked like, right? The kind of nerdy ones, the kind of like not athletic ones. That was that team that this person was picking. Um, and it baffled me because here I was standing in line ready to get picked and he wasn't picking me. And I was getting really annoyed. I was getting really frustrated. I was like, why isn't he picking me, right? Um, lo and behold, you know, like the other team that had like where I was and so forth, creamed the other team. Um, it was fun. Anyways, <laughs> at the end, I was really curious. And I, I wanted to ask this kid, like, hey, why did you pick like all the people that aren't good? Um, and I'll never forget his response. He said, because that's what Jesus would do. I went to a private Christian elementary school, so you know there was some faith component there. Also showed me just how smart kids are. You know, don't underestimate them. They know a lot. But <laughs> I still remember that response, because that's what Jesus would do. Is that not what Paul is writing here in this passage, brothers and sisters? Jesus picked a team of misfits. He, he chose anything other than a stacked team. That was his methodology. He picked a bunch of lowly fishermen, a tax collector, dined and ate with prostitutes, healed lepers, spent time with the sick and the marginalized. That comprised most of Jesus' life. Jesus' team, Jesus' um, church should look more like that, a microcosm of a bunch of people who don't really have much to offer. That's how God's worked throughout history, too. He picked Moses, couldn't speak. David was a man after God's own heart. and He was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was depressed and ran away. And God used him to showcase his glory fire coming down out of heaven, right? Think about the kind of people God chooses. And Paul is saying, this is who you are. You're a bunch of nobodies, church in Corinth. And the same message for us today. We're a bunch of nobodies, nothing to offer God. And yet God still chose us. That has always been God's methodology, and that always works in the way he does in his wisdom. And perhaps this is why, as I thought about this. Perhaps God chose the cross as the instrument of salvation, this power to save, precisely because that's what humankind would not pick. In order for God to showcase his glory, in order for God to show how powerful he is, how great he is, for his glory to shine, he has to work against human wisdom and methodologies. And so he chose this lowly, old, rugged cross and hung his, his son on there to die for our sins. And that that is the power to save a sinful, rebellious people. Notice how highly Paul also esteems Christ here. He writes this in verse 30. He says, and because of him, you are in Christ who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It's all boiled up in there, that we receive the righteousness of Christ. Someone said that earlier today. We receive Jesus' perfect track record, essentially. Right? His perfect sinlessness we receive as we place our trust in him. Sanctification, the process of becoming Christ-like in this Christian journey, in this Christian walk, and then the final redemption, where we are made whole and perfect, and we can see God 
face to face one day. This whole process all boiled up is, is all found in Christ. And Paul is esteeming Christ once again, saying, how can you start looking for other people to say other things about salvation and this message of the cross when everything you need, everything you need is found in Jesus. Everything you need is found in Christ. To the moment of salvation, to our ongoing sanctification of becoming Christ-like, to our final glorification and of being reunited with God for eternity. All of that, all of that, Paul is saying, is because of Christ, because of Jesus, because it started with this cross that he died on for us. And 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 he's basically telling the church, and now you're looking for other things, other messages? Why? Everything you need is found here. Paul is really trying to preserve this message of the cross, and we should too. Preachers, Pastor Edmund, myself, Donovan, should not try to enhance the gospel in any way, to accentuate it in any way, but to preach exactly what it says. But also, as a congregation, as listeners and hearers of the word, should not expect anything more to be added on top of the gospel, but just the gospel itself. Just this message of the cross itself. That's all that needs to be heard. Paul sort of ends with this last um, prescription for this church, and I think for us today. He says this, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let the one who boasts, boast. Um, I equate this word boasting oftentimes to be a very self-centered, prideful thing, like I'm boasting, you know, in myself. Look at what I can do. Look at all my accomplishments and all of that. But think of that idea of boasting and translating all of those feelings to God. That's what Paul is saying, is boast in the Lord. Anything about you that you want to take credit for, that you want to um, esteem highly or bring up, all of those things, no. Deflect back to God. Boast in him. Boast in how great he is, not in how great you are. Remember, we have nothing to offer, right? God picked us. We have nothing to offer God. Uh, I once heard it said this way that, you know, when it comes to the church, when it comes to Christians, that um, God chose the very worst um, to showcase his very best. I think sometimes our problem as a church is we don't know just how wretchedly sinful we are that God would choose me. And ask yourself, and consider that today, brothers and sisters, out of all the people in this world, out of all the people, your own life story, all the things that have gone on in your life, that God would choose you to save you by his grace to the point where you're sitting here today worshiping this God who saved you from your sin. All the factors that have played to where you are right now to this day, God has orchestrated every single detail of your life. To the moment of salvation, to now this ongoing process of how we grow together as a church. And the promise here and what what Paul is saying is, is it's going to continue to happen because Jesus is the one who's transforming us. He's the one that's changing us and growing us. And everything we need and want is found in him. And because of that, all the things that we do, all the credit that we sometimes want to take for ourselves, we give it back to God because it's all about him. It's all about his faithfulness. It's all about the work that he initiated, that he started, he continues, and he will fulfill. Paul saying, that's why you boast. That's why you boast. Let's pray. I actually want to start this prayer off with a um, quote from John Piper, Um, but it's actually in the form of a question, and that's the question that I want to ask you today, Faith Harvest. See, he writes this, the crucial question for your future and the future of this um, Christian walk is this, will we be ashamed of believing what the Bible teaches when the world calls us fools? Or will we out-rejoice the world 
not only in spite of, but because of their insults? Will we out-rejoice the world, not only in spite of, but because or through their insults? So I want to just take a moment. Um, first, consider how, how good God is in choosing a bunch of ordinary people who don't have much to offer. I'm first in line there. I have no business being up in this pulpit preaching the word of God if it wasn't for his grace. So let's just thank God that he would choose us um, for this gift of salvation, this old message of the cross that we've heard so many times, but no matter how familiar it is to us that it never gets old, brothers and sisters, it's God's wisdom, it's God's power to save, And through this work of the cross, um, we have the outworkings of that salvation as we continue to follow Christ in our daily lives. So can we just respond with that, just with gratitude, with praise and thanksgiving? Um, And if you would dare to go so far, to boast. Boast in the Lord, brothers and sisters. Boast in the Lord right now. I want to invite you to.